advice. You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need a wrong or right. You never know. If Hello, it's, your it's a special bonus episode of Dungeon Master of None. I'm Dungeon Master Matt, and today I have with me special guest Andy, and we are going to talk about our most frequent problem question that people have written us about running D&D for children, for kids, or for teens, whatever you define children as. Andy, thanks so much for coming on the show again. Hey, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be fun. Uh, Won't someone think of the children? I I think we are finally thinking of the children. (laughs) Hooray, that's great. How is your quarantine going, Andy? Specifically your D&D quarantine. What's your setup like? Who are your guys? What's your... your, uh, laptop and computer how many monitors are you running as you dungeon master games online uh i mean actually my gaming setup or that my game in sitch is better than my gaming sitch when we're not quarantining i've uh i i'm playing a lot of games and having a lot of fun it's one of the things that this time at home is good for um you're I'm a fully st- digital creature now <laughs> yeah, for a 50-year-old, which means I, I need a lot of help from people figuring out the technology oh. part of it. But uh, yeah, no, I've got a, a great setup. I'm sitting here. I've got uh, I've got a couple of computers in front of me using one of them for a mic and uh, kind of a big screen with a touch tablet so that I can uh, do marking on boards. You know, sometimes one of the big challenges with the online gaming is getting the graphics right so that people can see some of the the visual aid type stuff you're trying to share, whether that means doing a map board or showing off pictures or whatever. And so having, you know, just a few tools at your disposal to do that is really helpful. Yeah, do you have something like a like a quick like whiteboard that you can quickly draw on that everyone can see or something like that? Yeah, one of the tools that I've been making a lot of use of because it's free is a Google product called Jamboard. It's one of the things that you can get out through Google. And basically, it's a shared whiteboard. So everyone who logs into it can scribble away at it, can draw on it. It's been a great way to do mapping and people can add their own little notes to the Jamboard. And then these things persist into later sessions. So I I would encourage everyone to check that out and see if it might be useful for your setup. Yeah, we we talked a lot a couple episodes ago about all the various online setups and the, the fancy shit, you know, Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, Virtual Tabletop, Tabletop Simulator. But we also said, right, just having something that you can draw on and share is probably just as good, if not better than all of those things. Yeah, but all these things, I think, really are, it's important to emphasize, all these these things are just helpers for the most essential thing, which is having a good group of people and the ability to communicate. There's really no reason in the world why you can't just do theater of the mind stuff and have fun over Skype. I understand that lots of people need lots of visual aids, and those are the people who really need to have more of these tools at their disposal. But the key element in all these online games is just having a good group of people who can have fun together and can communicate with each other. That's the core element without which all this fails. Once you nail that down, everything else is really just building on something great. Hell yeah. Okay, let's talk about um, the kids. So first, we got to put out our bona fides, bone fides. Let's put those out there. Um, I don't have kids, but I do have uh, children that I teach at school. I've run some games for uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. I have not run games for very young children. Uh, what's your what's your children's situation, uh, children experience? So I do have kids and have had kids from very young now to full grown adults. And so as a gamer and as a person who likes to share things that I enjoy, I have shared gaming with my kids and have had. Ah, but but did uh, did you share it with them too early? Did you ruin role playing games for them and now they are not interested? Well, I think of my two kids, one is more interested than the other in role-playing games. So in that sense, either I ruined it for the one who didn't enjoy it so much, 
or she decided that this wasn't really for her and she wants to do other things, which may be the most valid of all possible results of being exposed to role-playing games, right? Who Absolutely. wants you to do things that they don't like? So, uh, yeah, in, in that sense, sure, I ruined my daughter on role-playing games. <laughs> uh, uh, people, people have told us about being afraid of this, and I think... Hopefully you've assuaged their fears. Well, I don't know if it's possible to assuage that fear because uh, parents who really love role-playing games really want their kids to love them too. But that's the same story across all of humanity. People who are baseball nuts want their kids to be baseball nuts. And sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. And everyone just needs to deal with that. So hopefully... Rather than assuaging that fear, hopefully we can get people around to the idea where, hey, it's okay if I expose kids to things that I like, and maybe they're going to like it, but maybe they won't, and that's all right. A good point. I think in the past, I sort of, uh, before I had really run games for kids or for teens, uh, I was like, oh, maybe I got to like do all these things differently. And there are some things you have to do differently, but I think my main takeaway from my experience, and it's really over been over the past year or so, has been that, at least for me, again, running for older middle schoolers and high schoolers, there's not that much difference in running for people my own age. Maybe some of the you know topics and jokes are completely different, but the basic idea of a role-playing game of, telling a story with your uh, friends or students is pretty much the same. And after I got that first session under the belt, under my belt, right, that like sort of fear of, oh, do I really have to like reinvent the wheel sort of, it dropped away. So let me tell you how I came at this with yeah. running games for kids for a long time, for a number of years. I was an organizer of a role-playing game convention, well, a game convention that included role-playing games. And I was one of the organizers who began to realize that the demographics of gaming were changing, that we were increasingly seeing uh, a lot more uh, kids coming into the convention, a lot more gamers who had kids who were like, hey, my kid doesn't really have anything to do, you know, what can we do? And so from that standpoint, as an organizer of a convention, I started exploring, uh, uh, this, is, uh, over, this is decades ago, I started exploring, well, what is out there for kids to do role-playing games? And what I discovered at the time was that uh, people who were trying to run games for kids, who were putting products out there, largely were treating games for kids as if you were running a game for stupid adults. And uh, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I would like sit in on or lurk or, or you know observe the results of these games where DMs were like trying to run the exact same kind of game they would run for adults, only they were speaking more loudly and slowly and using smaller words. And often the kids were just sitting there with these looks on their faces, like, what is this? And, you know, this is like class, uh, only there's there's no snack time. And um, so uh, what I resolved to try and do organically was trying to figure out how you could roll a, run a better game for kids. And, and I agree with your statement, which is that there are more things in common with running such a game for adults mm -hmm. than it is not. Uh, and, and really the number of things that you need to change based on it being a kid are, are fairly small and fairly subtle. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same game kids. Uh, it, I think everyone like forgets that. I don't know about you, but like I came to role playing games as a teen, right? Um, and uh, the, our games were not run any differently. We didn't you we didn't you know avoid using the word charisma because we were afraid no one would know the vocabulary, right? <laughs> right, right. I, I I was in the same boat. I actually started maybe a little earlier than you. I was ten when I played in my first game of Dungeons and Dragons, and we were kids. It was being played by and for kids. And so, you know, obviously didn't kill me. And, you know, here I am 40 years later, still doing the same thing. So, but I, I would say that one of the first questions that gets asked when people are like, hey, maybe I should introduce my kids to role-playing games. One of the first questions that gets asked is, well, how old is the right age 
to introduce a kid to role playing games? And mm -hmm. that's a that's a tough question because obviously every kid's different. And as soon as someone pops up and says, "Oh, you have to be X age," then someone's going to say, "Well, my kid was two years younger than that, and they did fine." So you know, great. Every every kid's different. Here's what I'd say. Um, you a kid ha should have all the tools necessary to be able to play in a role playing game exactly as it was originally designed by the time they're 10. Um, and, you know, by that time, they should have enough maturity to be able to understand complex concepts. They should have enough patience to be able to work through uh, all but the most complicated complex of rule sets. Uh, and, you know, they have the ability to interact with each other on a very complex level. And while they're still creative and intelligent people, and so I think ten is the is the point where you can do everything, but you can be substantially younger than ten and still be able to do lots of fun game type things. I would think that you could be as young as four and do well. Okay, you could be any age to play creative games mm -hmm. and. Uh, role-playing games and, oh, I'm pretending to be this and pretending to be that. But within the, the framework of kind of codified rule systems, I would think that by the time you're four years old, you can start doing some of the basic things of, okay, I am this person, but for a few minutes, I'm going to pretend to be something completely different. And that's fun. And uh, then within wearing that almost like a, a mask or a costume, wearing that identity, I am going to explore this and have fun with it. And that's something that can happen early. Yeah, I've had middle school students who have had a uh, much more will and a better grasp of rules and how the game works and what the idea of a role playing is game is than than uh, people in graduate school. And yeah, again, it's not to say you should start off a four year old with uh, Hero uh, System Sixth Edition or the Warhammer uh, Fantasy Role Playing Game. You know, maybe No Thank You Evil or something a little more homebrewed is <laughs> is best for a four year old. But yeah. Uh, I age is not the the hard barrier that I think a lot of folks think it is. Right. So let's talk about what those barriers are. Yeah. Um, when we're worried about running a game for a kid and we're worried, OK, maybe the kid's not going to get it or maybe the kid's not going to have fun doing it. What are those barriers? Well, OK, one of them is complexity that you cannot expect a four-year-old kid to listen to even 20 seconds of explanation of a hero system six champion style you know rules articulation and without their eyes glazing over and them walking off so definitely you know depending on the maturity of the kids depending on how far along they are on being able to understand and appreciate things depending on how good their concentration is how long they can stay focused on things those things are going to drive whether a kid needs to have a really simple straightforward easy to explain system or whether they can take that into things that are more complicated all right complexity yeah. is one yeah. thing another thing is themes um uh, adults are often worried about, am I going to expose my kids to things that they're not emotionally ready for, or things that I, as a parent, am not emotionally ready for them <laughs> to be exposed to? Uh, I definitely would think that having a really bloodthirsty Warhammer game is not the sort of thing that you want to expose very young children to. Um, but of course, that too depends very much on your family and your dynamic and, and the kids that we're talking about. And I'm sure some kids are better suited to be able to handle that kind of game than others. So, yeah. all right, complexity themes, but I think themes. the most, okay. One of the most important ones that often gets left in the dust is, is touchstones that kids need to, in order for anyone to connect to a role-playing game, there needs to be some aspect of that game that, that, that sounds familiar to them, that is something that they can say, oh yeah, I can relate to that 
so that I can play a role in it. And uh, I think often people... Right, so start them off with a uh, transhumanist uh, space RPG, uh, you know, that they uh, <laughs> right. really show... No, yeah, yeah, this is exactly right, right? Well, it's got to so- be themes and ideas that, that they're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've imagined that before. I've well, let me get, let me give you the, about that before. Let me give you the the uh, the platonic ideal of uh, lacking a touchstone in a role playing game system for kids. All right. Uh, whenever I talk, have this conversation with adults, hey, what's the best game to run for kids? Uh, one of the most common suggestions that I hear come out of people's mouths is Tune. That uh, people may remember this game from the eighties, where you oh. are where you are role-playing a cartoon character from mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck type cartoons. And, uh, and you know what? When properly run with people my age, that game is a hoot. But kids these days are not watching that kind of cartoon. They're watching an entirely different kind of cartoon experience, if they're watching cartoons at all. And I think that... Listen, uh, my my children will only watch procedurally generated Peppa Pig videos where <laughs> she like raps along to a popular music song and then stares into the camera for five minutes. Right. I mean, w- one of the key elements of Tune is the idea that your uh, your uh, your uh, coyote can paint a picture of a tunnel on a wall and then can somehow be tricked to try and run through it and smash his face right uh, that is kind of a that's kind of a meme that is unique to uh, that certain brand of Warner Brothers cartoons from back in the day that kids today have absolutely no understanding of. And so trying to run Tune is almost guaranteed to fail unless you're talking about with a group of people who have actually seen those cartoons. So that's the kind of thing where, but it's really not just Tune. If you take it a step further and you say, hey, Dungeons and Dragons, this whole idea of people going around and exploring things and taking stuff. Um, So you have to ask the question, does my kid understand that? If your kid is a kid who, say, has been raised on computer games of a certain sort mm-hmm. that are kind of role-playing game type stuff, then they're then they're right in there. They totally understand that concept and they're going to get it. But if they're a kid who hasn't had that particular basis or they haven't watched Adventure Time or something like that, then they may not get Dungeons & Dragons at all. And you may want to actually look at a different kind of game that is going to be something that will be more according to what they understand and can feel. I found again, running for teens, right. Is that their sort of source of speculative fiction came from the familiar sources, right? Star Wars, uh, Lord of the Rings for some of them, but for the one that like all of them touched on was, uh, and maybe this is just particular to my school was anime. Right. And I don't really get anime. I, I, <laughs> I have not watched much anime, um, but right. The ideas that they brought to the game, which is, you know, we're a group of heroes on some kind of mission. Right. Worked perfectly for the things I wanted to do um, uh, with them. Right. And it was like easy enough to be like, oh, yeah, uh, anime shows have this cast of characters. They're all heroes. Some of them have special powers. Perfect. You're good so- to go. That actually brings me to one of my first recommendations for a role-playing game that's good for kids. Uh, and uh, I want I think people who have kids who enjoy anime, maybe have enjoyed the Miyazaki movie, mm-hmm. might want to consider checking out Ryutama. Um, this is a role-playing game out of Japan. Uh, designer was uh, Atsuhiro Kata. And it basically models a lot of kind of Miyazaki and anime style uh, uh, adventures. The, the, I guess the classical way to describe these things is sort of heartwarming stuff in the sense that it's less about hunting down things and killing it and taking its stuff. And it's a lot more almost kind of focused on traveling around and experiencing wonder and joy in the things and people that you encounter. Um, And so in that sense, that might be a better game for kids who are less hack and slash oriented. Um, 
And, um, you know, that's that's a fun game in the sense that you are replacing a lot of the more kind of violent tropes with maybe doing some more kind of resource management or uh, more um, kind of uh, sharing the the amazingness of the fantastic places that their characters are are visiting and then their explorations of them. And so I, I think Rio Tom is a great game for them. Interesting. So it's more like, you know, befriend the evil spirit and figure out what's wrong and turn it back into a good spirit in the Miyazaki kind of way instead of uh, murder it. Absolutely. And okay. and which is not to say that there is never any violence whatsoever in those things, um, uh, just as is the case with Miyazaki. Sometimes there is lots of violence, but it is kind of presented as just one of many possible things that you can do in solutions to problems. Okay, so we've got a uh, majority uh, I theme touchstones. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else on the sort of, uh, you know, deciding how to get started that we want to cover? Well, only in the sense that I think that all kids are sufficiently different that you really can't go into, if you, once you decide you're going to run a game for kids, you can't say, here's the game I'm going to run and then round up your kids. That doesn't work. You've got to round up your kids, figure out what your kids are into, and then mold whatever game you're going to run according to that. Uh, because if you don't do that, you are running the risk that the particular kid and your, the particulars of your game are not going to align well, and you're disappointed, and they're going to be disappointed. So if you if you are the kind of person who is asking the questions in the letters that they keep sending to you, then you are the kind of person who cares about making sure that. Uh, the kids have the best possible experience and so they should think about tailoring the game to the kid, not the other way around. I mean, this is exactly the same as running a game for your friends. If your friends come to you because they know you're into role playing games and they want to play Dungeons and Dragons because they saw it on Stranger Things and you end up wanting to run a Vampire the Masquerade game, unless that's something those friends are also interested in. Right. You're probably going to have a better time running uh, Dungeons and Dragons. One other thing I think in introducing kids to role-playing games that I found worked in my experience that is exactly the same as with adults is during that, you know, first session, right? Maybe after you've handed out characters or they've made characters and that introducing how the basic, I guess, sort of universal, maybe, you know, asterisks there, mechanic of role-playing games of, okay, Here's the situation that I present to you as game master. You tell me what you want to do. And occasionally we're going to roll some dice to figure out if what you want to do succeeds, right? Introducing well, that mechanic straight away was something that none of my students, middle schoolers and high school had trouble with uh, grasping. They, they got it perfectly. Well, let me, let me challenge that right, okay, out, of, sure. right out of the gate. Um, because I don't want us to limit ourselves to only a very small subset of possible role-playing games, okay? That's true. Uh, Asterisks on the universal mechanic there. Right. Yeah. So the mechanic you just described is what I think of as the, uh, the core mechanic of what I would describe as a narrative role-playing game. A narrative yes. role-playing game is one where you have something like a dungeon master or a game master, a person who's presenting the action, and they kind of throw things over the over the net to the kids, and the kids have to deal with it and send it back over. And but it's 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 kind of a react action and reaction generated by a person who's essentially telling a tale with the help of the players, mm -hmm. right? So that's the narrative model. But there's another model that I think lots of games are, are getting a lot of traction with. And that what I'm going to argue is that many kids get a lot more traction out of than adults. And that is kind of a more of a cooperative or more of a distributed uh, 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 game mastering approach. When you have a game where the all the participants, not just the game master, have more kind of authority and have more ability to dictate what happens and what the world is like, then that is definitely departing from the original narrative model of role-playing games that I learned when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But that is something that allows 
people to exercise more personal creativity and more personal agency. And that in turn can get a lot of people a lot more invested in the game that they're playing in. And so I think that if you have a kid, say, who is into playing computer games, then those kids are potentially going to appreciate the narrative form more because they are used to the computer kind of presenting them with the scene and then their character interacts with that scene. Uh, but for more kind of creative kids, uh, I think they would get frustrated with that environment. It, it, going around the other direction, if you have a more open-ended game, like uh, say The Quiet Year, which I'm going to mm. talk about here in a second, but if you have where everyone needs to sort of contribute creatively to the setting, I think the kids who were raised on playing computer, you know, first person shooter games are going to flail. They're, they're going to not get it in that setting. So I, I think knowing whether you have a kid who's more gravitated to the narrative or more gravitating to the cooperative style of play really dictates what type of game you want to run. Uh, and- I don't know about this uh, fancy uh, hippy dippy Montessori style uh, dungeon mastering, Andy. No, no, <laughs> seriously, uh, Quiet Years a great game. Uh, I have not run a cooperative game uh, for students, but I have experienced that. You know, just like with adults, the more agency children have to either make their character feel special, make the world feel special, make the world feel their own, right? They're sort of intrinsically invested in in the game. My students are uh, sadly like very, very, very disappointed and have been messaging me about like what happens next. And because we have a narrative game that, uh, you know, I can't really play with them right now, uh, you know, they're out of luck. If only I run a more cooperative style game. Yes, that's a very sad story you just told, Matt. I'm it, sorry it, for your kids. It, uh, sorry. It's I, a huge bummer. I'm not kidding. I, that's that is a sad story because I, I want to, uh, you know, I think your middle school kids probably love your game. I know how creative you are, and I'm sorry you guys can't do it. And I hope you can find a way to do it in these uh coronavirus times. Maybe one of the many tragedies, uh. Tiny, tiny tragedies that uh, we're all dealing with. Um, okay, so The Quiet Year, right? Uh, yeah. Any other suggestions for cooperative games or why The Quiet Year has uh, worked for you, kids you've run with? Well, let's just delve into it. I mean, The Quiet Year is kind of an interesting game. It's it's a post-apocalyptic game. I mean, it's fun. very appropriate for right now. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you don't think, oh, kids, they should be playing totally a, a game that happens long after a disaster has wiped out the world. But um, it, it really fits pretty well. It's actually a map. Listen, Zoomers are very in tune with uh, the end of the world, in my yeah. experience. They well, get it. Maybe okay. more than us. <laughs> well, the quiet year is centered around kind of a building a map, and then you have draws of the cards to figure out what different cultures and societies are are going to do, how you rebuild from this post apocalyptic thing, and 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 what ways are you going to rebuild the society? And so, you know, everyone has an opportunity to kind of contribute to this shared world and come up with conflicts and interesting things that can happen within it and so it, it definitely doesn't follow the usual model okay our our band of heroes is going to head into the dungeon and slaughter thing but it is also a, a very good creative outlet and i think um i think kids of really probably down to seven or eight could really enjoy the quiet year. it's a great um, game yeah um but let's see so any uh, what other what other things do we want to as dungeon masters or game masters do we want to think about like before that first session or just think about in sort of presenting the idea of any type of role playing game for children right because i think the biggest hurdle that uh, i've encountered from our listeners is like i want to run games for kids uh, you know, I just have all these anxieties about that first session. Right. Well, so actually, this is this is a good one. Um, I would recommend that people who have those anxieties check out Dungeon World. Why check out Dungeon World? So, you know, Dungeon World is uh, kind of a port of the standard Dungeons and Dragons trope, 
more towards sort of a storytelling type game. So mm-hmm. it sort of occupies a space halfway between Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, fiasco type things. Yeah, um, it's but, powered by the apocalypse system, crunchy right. enough, but uh, right. very much in that powered by the apocalypse um, cadence of right. interaction between the dungeon master and players. I don't know if that's the right word, but. But here's where Dungeon World shines. Uh, the rule set has, like you said, a lot of crunch, a lot of good stuff. But one of the things it does absolutely best is it has instructions to GMs on how to run this game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, many, many games are great at telling you what the rules are, but not so great on telling you, here's how you should do it. And here's ideas for what you can do. And Dungeon Go World... listen to our episode on Dungeon World if you, if you uh, uh, need more details. Yeah, yeah. That, anyway, Dungeon World is definitely one of my top recommendations for that uh, in in helping people figure out what they want to do. But but one of the most important things, I think, for when you're running with kids and being prepared when you're running for kids is to have some ideas at your fingertips for what you're going to do, interesting things that are going to happen. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, that you know, that's what everyone wants to experience in these kinds of games is they want to have interesting things happen that they can interact with, that they can cause even more interesting things to happen. And if you can start out by having just a few note cards at your fingertips that, uh, that says, uh, you know, little elephants with butterfly wings, uh, and just have stuff like that, that you can throw out there and it's, it's weird and it's interesting, grabs the imagination of your players I, frankly, I recommend doing that whether you have kids or adults, that you have plenty of ideas for neat stuff that you can throw out there. And a good game for that is uh, Amazing Tales. Um, so uh, science fiction author Cory Doctorow loves this game. And he talks about how when he went on tour, he played it incessantly with his daughter. because it, you know, I guess he had a young daughter at the time and, and they loved it. It's very much kind of a storytelling game, but the game comes with these prompts. It, it gives you like these cards that have on it ideas for things that y- your characters can encounter. And then you guys, then there's a rules framework where you take turns kind of inventing what happens within that framework. And so it's it's a pretty good game for really taking creative kids and saying, okay, what can you think of that could happen in this situation that would be fun and interesting? And, uh, and it does give you the prompts. It, it actually has cards that you can use. So that's a very useful thing. An awesome recommendation. Amazing tales. Amazing. A good, uh, a good uh, additional recommendation in a similar vein, No Thank You Evil, uh, mm-hmm. Monty Cook Games, um, also a storytelling game. But interestingly, uh, uh, kind of more of a, um, I don't know, more of a Dungeons and Dragons y feel, I guess I would say. It doesn't have to yeah. be. No, no, thank you, evil. You could be a robot, you can be uh, an alien if you want to. But uh, it definitely seems to be a little more structured in the you're going to assemble your, your team and then you're going right. to go and have adventures. I really but- like the, um, uh, tactile things they've added to the game or that is in that game, like the character sheets as whiteboards, I think, and uh, little tokens that are uh, fun and easy for even very small kids uh, to yeah. interact yeah. with. The more you can get kids involved tactilely using all their senses in a game, the more likely they're going to grab it. So, for instance, when I was running games for kids at my convention, uh, one of the things I did, I started by running a game and I said, "Okay, your characters are all senior citizens. You're all old folks in an old folks home. And so you're all (laughs) you're all incredibly ancient and. uh, And uh, so here's this old folks home. And why don't you help me draw the old folks home? And so I had a piece of butcher paper out on the on. Mm -hmm. I started by having the kids pick up pens and crayons and help me essentially create a map of the old folks home. And then the action starts when bad guys invade. And then we have to start actually having an adventure, uh, you know, repelling the invaders from your home. Um, 
but uh, but by getting the kids involved and actually drawing the map, that really kind of drew them in. And they're like, oh, can there be an attic? Can I draw a second floor over here off to the side? And I was like, oh, yeah. And then one of them was like, I, there's got to be a key. It's a map. It's got to have a key. Yeah, okay, you, you draw the key. <laughs> no, that is an excellent point. Even just uh, the dice themselves, right? Um, if you're like me, and I know some of our listeners are, a teacher who is running uh, Dungeons & Dragons for their students, right? Buying that, uh, you know, I know our all our funds are limited, but that pound of dice and giving students who play in your game at least their own d20 like i would at least on the middle school section of my floor see the students showing the d20s to other kids like they were and maybe they are these magic keys that unlock this new realm of fun right yeah i think the more you can do little things that they hold in their hands the better um, I, I don't think any game ever has to have like painted tokens or markers or figs, although many people get a lot of enjoyment out of it. But I think if you can have like an interesting little token that they can use to to move around the board, I think. Oh, yeah. Are, can, and if you yeah. if you haven't done this yet, you can buy these little one inch wooden discs, which is what I did with my middle school students. And uh, because. Yeah, I don't have the money to like buy miniatures for them all or the desire to have those in my game. But just whenever we would need to represent anything, I at the beginning of the game, I session two gave them all a wooden token and be like, all right, draw a symbol or something on this that represents your character. And boom, they 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 love that. Uh, right. Your example of the old folks home brings up another sort of uh, question uh, that I think some folks have asked themselves when running for children is I think there might be mm, uh, a tendency or a idea that, oh, if I'm going to run for kids, the characters that they play need to be kids themselves or something like that. Well, that's, that's crazy. That's, not. that's crazy. That's true? No, that is definitely not true. I mean, the whole reason that we play role-playing games as adults is to be something other than what we are. So why would that be any different for kids? Uh, I think kids more so than adults hunger to uh, experience the world as something other than relatively uh, impotent and uh, you know, small participants. They want to have power. They want to have authority. They they want to have uh, the ability to go and do uh, in a world where kids are often very limited. And I think uh, I think kids that I have played with have been much more responsive to games where they either aren't playing kids or are playing kids with an extended sense of what they can and cannot do in the world. I so. think you're absolutely right. I never like in the, the first session playing with middle schoolers, they were all like, uh, you know, you know, that moment when you're DMing where you've really like, you realize you've stepped back from the game and you haven't actually said anything for 15 minutes or something, but you don't need to because everyone is having a blast happened <laughs> when students had the power of uh, oh they had discovered an e you know a sh the local shopkeep was an evil spy and that you know they were in charge with charged with dealing with persons like this and they had to decide whether to you know turn this person in or do something else with them or let them go and that sort of authority right which is not something my middle school students <laughs> ever really have was um, intoxicating right I loved it yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would think that uh, kids uh, have the exact same drivers for the what draws you into a role-playing game as non-kids do. It's almost like uh, children are also human beings. What? Really? <laughs> so this puts me at the far left uh, wing of the political spectrum in America. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get roasted for this, but I'm going to say it. Well, okay. <laughs> Hey, All listen, right. uh, when we're talking about tactile things, I'm sorry, I'm skipping mm -hmm. around. Yeah, no, that's fine. 
I'm going to go back to tactile things. Um, I think a very good tactile thing when you're thinking about games to run with kids is those games that actually present you with a playbook. Uh, in other words, a game mm -hmm. that doesn't just give you a character sheet, but also has basically the listed rules and what your character can do in enough detail that they know how to read it and do it right there on the piece of paper that's in front of them. Uh, so absolutely, the I, I just want to jump in here and say that uh, the basically every edition, but especially the fifth edition uh, character sheet of Dungeons and Dragons is not very good at this. I would recommend, and I, this goes for children and new players, reprinting those character sheets so that the you know interesting powers, abilities, or things you can do, and Dungeon World is very good with this because every character sheet has a playbook built in, uh, you know, repri retype or reprint out your character sheet in a more playbook fashion. Right. And, you know, even if you have to spend a little bit of work doing it, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons is the 800 pound gorilla. That is the yardstick by which we're going to measure success of, of practically any role playing game uh, just by dint of how many people are playing it and how popular it is. Um, and fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, in my opinion, really really well but one of the things that it could definitely improve on is the simplifying looking up what it is your character can do and uh, like you said all the powered by apocalypse games like dungeon world do a pretty good job with the playbooks another one i want to recommend is a game called beyond the wall um, which also uses playbooks i'm not familiar with this uh, Beyond the Wall is pretty cool. It's it's uh, it's a very simplified rule set. I would think of it as an OSR game in the sense that it has this aesthetic of having sort of mini rule books uh, that uh, kind of harken back to the 70s and 80s uh, simplicity wise of rule sets. Um, and it's a game that is sort of Dungeons and Dragons like, basically fairy creatures from the beyond the wall are invading and you have to figure out what you're going to do about it. But just because the system is so simple and it has these lovely playbooks that you can work off of, um, I think it lends itself really well for more of a narrative style uh, Dungeons and Dragons like experience if you're looking for something to get kids invested in it early. Hell yeah, beyond the wall. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, when if you're looking for other things like D D that do D D type things really well. Um uh Hero Kids is a, a great game. It's by Hero Forge. Um it really takes the D D rule set and strips it down to almost nothing um so that kids can grasp the rules really quickly and begin running. And if they already understand the idea of characters banding together and running around to have adventures then um, that game has a really, really easy learning curve. And uh, I, I would recommend trying it out. Honestly, anything you can do, and again, this goes for new players as well as kids, to, um, I don't know, uh, hide all the fiddly bits of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition for your first couple play sessions. Honestly, the better, right? If you can right. train your players to be role players as opposed to people who learn the opportunity attacks and spell concentration rules. It, you'll, you'll have a better time in the long run. Oh, gosh. I mean, and, and you're absolutely right. And so for that reason, you should always prefer a simpler rule set to a more complex rule set. And I'm not sure that I would just limit that to games with kids. Uh, I think if you have people who are just starting out with role playing games of any age, uh, nothing is going to turn them off faster than realizing that there is more rules than is required for them to do their taxes. If it requires more study and understanding and reading through things than doing your taxes, then you're probably not going to want to do it. And so that's why games like Black Hack and Tiny D6 are uh, great choices for doing a D&D style game with kids. Um, they are incredibly simple. I mean, black hack, hey, roll this 20-sided die and try and roll low. And that's that's it. And uh, Tiny D6 is pretty simple, too. 
if you can give them a rule set like that, that is so simple that your character sheet could be on a three by five index card, then uh, that's that's so much better than having all the complexity of 5e or, you know, Pathfinder or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we've talked a lot about some really great ideas for uh, uh, visual and tactile aids of rule systems. What about like uh, adventure hooks or story ideas that you have found that have worked really well with children? So I think just about everything that works well with adults works well with kids as well. I think kids are interested in adventure. Kids understand that there are bad things and that sometimes you have to confront the bad things head on, uh, either with violence or with some other form of of uh, uh, conflict in order to resolve a situation. Um, I, I think I... I start to come back to the the whole themes thing and say, well, maybe I don't want to be too dark and, you know, flayed babies probably does not need to put it in an appearance in this game. But, um, <laughs> but, but other than that, I, I think, I think it can be a real mistake to try and dumb down the hooks for kids. I, I, kids, cause most kids can, you know, have consumed enough media, have read enough stories or have seen enough shows to understand most of the possible adventure type themes. And uh, I, I will say that it's a good idea to try and involve kids maybe personally in stories rather than in the abstract. Here are things that are happening to you or people that you care about. Uh, you run the risk of uh, kids tuning out if you get too much into uh, stories of uh, things that are happening to great nations elsewhere. Um, you know, for in the example of the old folks' home and the kids as the characters there, the the main hook to that game was that uh, suddenly uh, time is reversing itself very rapidly in the city. And so most of the younger people in the town basically wink out of existence because they've de-aged to the point before they, which they were born. <laughs> and only the senior citizens of, of, uh, are, uh, remain, there, uh, remain youthful enough and, and prepared enough. And so this... this, this only this, senior <laughs> citizens in a town. What are we talking about here, Andy? The well, Republican electorate? Uh, well, in this case, it's the old folks home of retired adventurers, you see. So, ah, so as they start to de-age, then they get up into the attic and they get all the gear out and they start trying to figure out what's going wrong in their city. And so oh, that is that's a, beautiful. That's an, an example of something that's actually directly happening to them. So they can say, oh, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. I think that's a lot easier for uh, neophyte role players to grab than... Uh, oh no! The uh, there is a dragon menacing the kingdom somewhere else in the kingdom. What do I feel about that? I don't know. Uh, trying to directly relate stuff to their characters, I think, is is a, a useful tack for not just for kids, but for anyone who's just learning the ropes of role play. Yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing, Andy, is definitely uh, set your game in an established universe: uh, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Star Wars, make sure your kids have read all the expanded universe novels. Be sure to point out when they do a thing that is not canon. Uh, basically, all the things that adults also just love. We have oh, here. yeah. Well, that comes back to the whole touchstone thing. Uh, yeah. you, you absolutely probably don't want to run a, Definitely game, not. A, a game in the Marvel universe where uh, not knowing... Uh, you know, multiple decades of trivia of comics lore is going to be a problem for you. Instead, you might want to consider doing a generic superhero game yes. using something like Bash uh, or, or Bash UE, the, the, the newer kind of expanded version uh, from basic action games, which allows you to very simply put together a superhero thing using kind of the same level of simplicity as Black Hack. And um, so that's a great game where as long as a kid understands, OK, there are superheroes and they have superpowers and they're going to do heroic things in the world, then uh, they can come up with their own heroes. And that's great. 
definitely not relying on touchstones of of a popular fiction that maybe kids haven't been as fully exposed to, or the opposite problem where sometimes kids are hyper fixated on it and you, the parent or the dungeon master, don't know enough about that setting to run the game because they'll be constantly saying, that's not what happens and that's not that kind of character. And so, you know, watch out when the kids become more of an expert than you are. Yeah. Uh, uh, weep, weep in the day when your your child starts explaining the. Uh, okay, I, I have been watching some anime. The 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 specialness of the first children and the uh, Evangelion project to you. Uh, so, <laughs> no, uh, I, I think I think it's also good advice for children and for adults. Right, I see so many uh, dungeon masters uh, saying for this you know adventure or something. I'm going to start my players off in prison or something like that and yeah you can do that but i think with uh children maybe that's the wrong way to go try not to start them off in a situation of um powerlessness instead uh start them off in a situation where the story affects them yet they have a ton of power and agency that they can Ooh, i can do this if i want to i can become the mayor of this city or etc I think I think agency is probably one of the most important things for kids to grasp and love a role playing game, because, frankly, kids don't have a lot of agency in the real world that uh, when it's time for bedtime, they pretty much need to go to bed and they don't get a whole lot of choice in the matter. But if kids have the ability to play a character that does have choices and those choices have real meaning in the universe that they're playing in, I think that can be incredibly attractive. And so that's a great way to try and hook a new role-playing gamer is to give, put them in a position, maybe not an all-powerful position yeah. with gods, but at least in a position where what they does, what, what, the things that they do matter. Absolutely. Uh, what uh, if we, I think we talked about some of the general things. Uh, do you have any uh, specific hooks? I have had a lot of success running some uh, uh, basically variations on classic open-ended modules where I've presented my middle school and high school students, both of those groups, with uh, just uh, open-ended uh, location-based adventures full of intrigue and fantastical stuff. Um, uh, do you have any specific uh, adventures or stories uh, besides your amazing uh, old folks' home adventures, which I want to play that now, um, that you might recommend? Yeah, so I, I think there is a sense among kids these days that to some degree adults are ruining their world. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of talk of, you know, yeah. the environment is going downhill and adults aren't doing enough to fix it. And so I think there's this sort of background feeling uh, among you know, many kids who I interact with that the bad things are happening in the world. What has, what that turns into for role playing is if you can run a story where there's sort of like a mystery where something bad has happened and it's up to the characters to figure out what it is and undo it, uh, that can be a very powerful story. Because, you know, if, uh, if the kids are adventurers and they're like, oh, previous generation has somehow uh, inflicted a curse on the world and it's on us to figure out what that is, what the source of it is and undo it, then that carries with it a parallel to environmental concerns and you know global conflict concerns and that can help people help young people feel better about a situation that in the real world they don't have a whole lot of power yeah it just anything intriguing or mystery uh adjacent right uh i uh gosh it's uh it was in my middle school schoolers uh, game. There was they they went into an abandoned hall and there was uh, a bunch of heraldic devices hanging on the wall, shields with, you know, lions and griffins on them. And one of them was scratched out. It was a tiny detail that I didn't expect them to even investigate or care about. But just the fact that there was this one shield that had been defaced they made it their goal to find this you know uh mystery knight who uh who was somehow cast out just because it was so mysterious right um they had to know why 
Yeah. So I, that that I've got to tell you about a cool tactile. Since we were talking about tactile thing, a tell cool, away. A cool thing that our mutual friend Angelo uh, talked about in an old game that you play in, uh, and basically the uh, the DM had this prop that he handed out. I don't remember the exact circumstances of it, but it was a rock. He handed a rock to the character. The character found this rock, and this rock they knew was somehow the key to uh, solving some sort of a riddle. And they knew this, and the DM just said, look, just hang on to that rock, and uh, you know, maybe at some point you'll figure out how to use it. And so the, the, the player actually held on to the rock and carried the rock around to the various sessions. But they never could really figure out what was up with that rock until finally one day, actually at the session, uh, the, the player dropped the rock and it fell on the ground and shattered. And basically the DM had baked one of those little suitcase keys inside. Oh my God. Kind of like a little... Oh that he'd made in an oven <laughs> and uh, that they had to shatter the rock and get the key. And so I, that, Amazing. That's, always, that's always lodged in my brain as something that I was like, man, if I ever run a game for a kid that needs some sort of a tactile thing, I've got to find a way to work that story into it. Oh, holy shit. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway. So oh. I, if you could yeah. do like a really neat prop like that, uh, that would blow kids' minds just as much or more as it would. Adults. And so I think they would, they would really dig it. I know one of my students still has that. She, I, I saw that she grabbed it on our last day before we went. It, the last day of the before time, uh, before we had to all uh, go home in her giant binder, right? You know, uh, made a letter that was, you know, fancy and uh, made it look like an old letter. And uh, that that was in her binder. And I saw it when she was like, you know, <laughs> students have their binders and it's, uh, you know, they're taking their math test and it's in that little plastic sleeve. And she had that in front of her because, yeah, kids like stuff. So I firmly believe that role, playing games is a a form of art that is a form of performance art and you know when you have grabbed kids when they begin bleeding that art over into the other kinds of art that they make and so when you've got kids who are like drawing their character oh and yeah like making little props and uh acting out little scenes that they're participating in when that happens you know you have grabbed them and you have succeeded as a game master as uh, if you were a teacher running this for a club or a class of students, there is like a 99.5% chance that if you find that student who loves to draw that as, as I did, they will not only draw their own characters, but say, Hey, will you draw everyone in the party? And they will absolutely leap at the chance to do this. Yeah. Right. And, and those are the same people who are so inspired by the fact that, hey, not only can I make myself happy with my art and I can make other people happy with it. These are people who actually, as adults, may find them on into a career in the arts. You they have forever cursed that child to become a freelance artist and the rest of their days will be unhappy. Well, uh, I'm just kidding. Just now, now I'm sad, but okay. Andy, what other um, key things did we miss in our discussion about D&D &D and kids? Other tips or tricks or things that you feel like folks should know uh, about running D&D &D for people younger than you? So I can't stress enough the idea, this tension between a narrative and a cooperative game. And I would encourage people, even people who are much more used to the old school narrative style of game, to at least dip your toe in the water of doing a little bit of cooperative type 
Shared Agency Gaming. And one of the best products out there for doing that is uh, Fate Accelerated. So I'm not talking about the Fate game by Evil Hat. I'm talking about they've got a, they've got a stripped down rule set called Fate Accelerated, which is great because, again, simplicity is a great thing. And uh, within the Fate system, it's it's one of those generic role playing game systems. You can play mm. practically anything. If you want to do science fiction or supers or D anD D, you can do that. Um, but yeah, it, like, Fate at, on its head is too complicated for what it's trying to do. I once was at a a conference where someone ran a Fate game to model the Cuban Missile Crisis yes. for students. And it was too complicated. I mean, I had played Fate before, so I was I was mopping the floor as current, uh, uh, General uh, Curtis LeMay, but everyone else was struggling to figure out the rules as <laughs> I pushed us towards nuclear oblivion. God damn, we got to take those missiles out. Yep. Well, listen. All right. So, yeah, I, Fate Accelerated. Sorry. <laughs> not Fate. Fate Accelerated. <laughs> much more stripped down deal and that it does have the, pro the same property as the other fate games that one of the things you do is you have tags where mm -hmm. you uh uh where you can basically uh every character has a tag and if you can role play with another character using that tag then you can either get a benefit or you can confer confer to them a benefit uh, and so that tag is something related to role playing. You know, if if your character is tagged as being boastful, uh, and if you can play on that and basically uh, try and work on another character and say, "Hey, I'm working on your boastfulness here. And I want you to, in the course of bragging, divulge some important secret," then uh, it's almost like you're the characters are all sharing in the responsibility of creating a fun story and it's not just on the gm to tell it and um but it's still more of a directive directed narrative story and that there's still a gm who tells you what you see and what you need to experience it just kind of dips its toe in more of this cooperative role-playing game i would encourage every gamer not just kids but every uh, adult gamer, I would encourage you to to try it out once, see if you like it, uh, and see if it would apply to the kids that you love and who you want to play with. And if it does, try it. But if it doesn't, okay, fine. You know, but you should always try these fun things. I was telling a friend the other day that I think it's incredible that there is an entire market of people out there who do nothing but creatively come up with fun things for me to do with role playing games and uh i feel i feel kind of an obligation anytime they do this that as long as their product is relatively accessible and e and easily priced i i feel an obligation to try it because they've spent all this effort coming up with fun things for me and uh as long as they're not dicks and as long as the product is reasonably accessible I feel like I need to try it. I think everyone should, because you never know. You might find that one really cool game that you never knew about that that scratches every itch, right? Uh, we've said before, and we'll say it again, people who create role-playing games or other fun games for us, they're they're braver than the troops. We, we, we <laughs> salute them. That, that's true. They are the real heroes. They're the, <laughs> the real heroes. I, I think I have a couple, like you know, really like minor things that, cause I know most of our, and I think your plug of uh, try a cooperative game with kids or teens is great. But I know most of us, uh, at least listeners to the show play D and D fifth edition. And just within that system, like be, you know, be as flexible as you can. Uh, don't kill someone's don't, don't yuck someone's yum in the first couple sessions, just a very, you know, mechanical example, like, you know, I had a, um, uh, a student who, you know, they, we picked classes and things and, you know, she wanted to be a, a, a wizard, but then, uh, she picked up a bow off of, um, you know, a, a dead, uh, bandit or something or Noel, I can't remember, but, like she loved the idea of using this bow and you know, uh, okay. Wizards are not proficient with bows, but uh, who fucking cares? She realized that she actually had a vision of her, you know, character as a badass archer and let them have that. And this goes with new players as well. Make sure your first couple encounters are, can be solved easily, even if they do 
things that are maybe uh, suboptimal or something like that, right? Really let them have those first fun early victories so that uh, when they struggle with something that is uh, maybe more deadly, more tricky, uh, that they can really uh, uh, appreciate it. I mean, I hate to think of games with kids as teachable moments because, you know, kids get enough of that. Uh, but yeah. uh, there's there's really no reason in the world why a role-playing game cannot be a cunningly disguised classroom for how to interact with others and how to interact with your with your own creative self. And so less kind of barking at your kids and saying, you're doing that wrong, you need to do it this way, and, and more kind of yes-anding of people's creative play uh, to help everyone figure out how to work together on this this fun and artistic endeavor absolutely you will be so rewarded running games for students or kids or teens just in you know really in just the first couple weeks i saw students grow in some of those interpersonal skills uh and really just like maybe not always, you know, deep friendships that, oh, the people I'm playing this game with are going to be friends with the rest of my life. But like, you know, the uh, hanging out for a couple hours with a student or uh, someone from a clique that I would not normally hang out with uh, is is really eye-opening for a lot of kids. And, you know, we'd be like, oh, this middle schooler here playing a game with some uh, freshman and sophomore just discovered that theater kids exist and that's the type of person I can be. And you know, that's, that's kind of beautiful. Yeah. I I had a friend who for many years used to say that role-playing games is what passes for socializing among nerds. And, you know, I was always like, ha ha ha. But like, it's actually kind of true. Kind of true. In, in, in the sense that it is certainly one more, form of social interaction and modeling social interaction and uh you know uh certainly not everyone who plays role-playing games falls into the the hoary old trope of oh they're a complete nerd basket case and then shut in but uh it's certainly true that it is an all-encompassing hobby and you certainly do get that kind of people and uh it's it's great for everyone to have a social outlet and that's one of the great things that gaming is for and the same is true for kids if you have kids who are shy if you have kids who have trouble making friends i've seen any number of kids sit down at my gaming table at a game i was running at a convention who didn't know any of the other kids at the table but then i like just give you an example uh in one game I had pre-generated characters and I gave them to these two very shy young girls. I think they were probably both about 10. And it says there, right there in the pre-printed character sheet that you two characters are sisters and you're rivals of each other and you hate each other for various reasons because mom says you're the smart one, but dad says you're the pretty one. And uh, those kids just sank their teeth into that. And then within a few minutes, they were basically screaming at each other, having fun, but yelling at each other across the table and having this feud. And all the other adults in the room who were playing their adult games were like, are those kids about to have a moment? Uh, (laughs) But I was having a great time because the kids were totally into it and they were role playing and they were having a ball and they were interacting with each other. And, uh, you know, that's, that's incredibly gratifying. Okay. Uh, Andy, we got to wrap up. I have some, uh, just quick questions, uh, that we should get to before we uh, close out. And thanks again for being a guest on the show again. Um, I had a question personally, um, about, uh, do, uh, have you ever run a game, a mixed game that is, you know, uh, kids and adults i think we've established so far that this is obviously not a problem or an issue but i was just wondering you know have you run a game where you've got maybe someone who is in middle school or a kid along with a table that is mostly not yes i i run a continuous set of drop-in games at cons and have for the last four or five years where basically people can sit down and be playing a D&D style game very quickly and uh, it's all takers welcome. So I frequently get tables where I've got a few kids who are playing along with adults and then 
that maybe don't know each other. And um, I think that's more doable than you expect. Uh, I, I think way too many people are like, oh, then now you've got to completely stop playing the adult game so that you can play the kid game. Well, that's not that's not true. And that's especially true if you have other adult players at the game who understand, okay, I've got kids at the table and uh, we need to take care of the kids while continuing to play our game. Uh, there's really no reason why you cannot do that. Again, as long as you just uh, you take care of the three themes I harped on earlier of complexity and not having two adult themes and making sure the kids have touchstones, as long as you can do those things, those things there's no reason why a kid can't play an adult game hell yeah uh i sign on uh a hundred a hundred and ten uh percent andy i have uh one more question i think our um discussion has answered the dozens or so of questions we've got on running with children but i had uh, a really specific and great letter that i wanted to read for us and see if we can uh take a swing at answering it okay here we here we go Hi, Matt and Rob. First off, I love your podcast. It's my favorite thing to listen to each week. You constantly inspire me each Wednesday to prep my campaigns for the week. I've been meaning to write this email for weeks now when you ask for people with experience DMing for kids. I'm a middle school science teacher and have been dungeon mastering for my students ages 11 through 14 for the last three years. I currently run two weekly campaigns. Ghosts of Salt Marsh and a hum homebrew campaign titled Trials of Tir Nadog. It's been fun to watch them grow as players as I begin to learn how to DM, a lot of which uh, was with great tips from you guys. Running games for kids is definitely fun and wacky. They love interacting with bizarre NPCs and role playing. They sometimes can re be really terrified of combat, but we are working through it as a table by having open discussions as a group. We add a sit down and discuss that it's okay to get hit in combat. We are working as a group to design encounters that feel more comfortable with many enemies versus one. This seems to have been relatively effective with the group. I have run into some issues though with them getting distracted during a session and constantly wanting to adopt literally everything. Bunny, owlbear, fire giant, and adult red dragon, doesn't matter. I've tried to satisfy this interest by allowing them to have some party pets and have used the supplemental third-party book, Baby Bestiary. However, it seems that they want the whole campaign to center around pet adoption, and I'm not sure how to handle this effectively. I want them to have fun and love D&D, but D&D is not Monster Rancher. Any advice on how to help uh, with that would be much appreciated. You guys are the best. Keep rolling those dice. Jin. So, uh, first of all, kudos to your letter writer for uh, running these games for the kids. Yeah, hell great. yeah, three years. Uh, the kids kids are our next generation of gamers, and uh, not only do we want to raise good gamers, but we want uh, the kids in our lives to have fun. That's great. Um, I, I'm going to have to come back to my original point of tailoring the game to the kids. And, you know, you can say, oh, d and is a monster rancher, but you have to ask the question, well, why is that? Does it well, have to What be? if it was? What, what if it was, Matt? What if it <laughs> was a game where it was possible to uh, tame, befriend, uh, neutralize, or at least make uh, not inherently hostile um, all, the, all the things that you come into conflict? What if it were possible to run a game that is more like a situation where you know, the kids can, you know, bring them into their fold? Um, I, 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 it's almost I, like maybe they could have a, a nature reserve demi plane uh, or uh, start their own little natural park. Yeah, I, I mean, why can't it be that there are monsters that become are inherently friendly with the with the people in the campaign. I, I I understand that that may not be the image that the game master had in his head when he I'm assuming it's a he when he wrote her, his, her head. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm I'm assuming this is what she had in her head when she wrote this letter. Um, but it, it begs the question whether 
D and D really has to be the thing that you thought it was, or whether it couldn't bend or deflect in the direction of uh, what the kids are more interested in playing. And and if you did do that, if you were able to make that creative leap and maybe morph your game in that direction, wouldn't you enjoy greater engagement with your kids and maybe have more creative flow? back in your direction from them if you could somehow figure out a way to incorporate this into your game. And I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm just saying it's an option and and that's the direction I would be interested in taking it if I were in your shoes. Yeah. If I had students who were interested in adopting everything, I think you've taken a step in the, in the right direction. And also I, I love Jin's tip on uh, dealing with students who are just uh, absolutely you know, too afraid to enter combat and uh, how she sort of built them up to that. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, I think having every character being able to get, you know, um, you could just easily adopt the rules from 5th edition for familiars or animal companions and reskin whatever they've adopted to be their pet, I think would work great. I'm assuming that's what uh, baby bestiary does. But okay, Andy, let's say, you know, this party of middle schoolers wants to adopt a do- an adult red dragon or a fire giant. Do we have a tip for that? I think I got an idea, but I'd like to hear what you have to so, say first. So you're thinking like something that is really just incredibly dangerous. Something that is incredibly dangerous, powerful, and probably a opposed to the goals of the player characters. Ooh, boy, that is a that is a poser and, that you that you've placed there, Matt. And yeah. now I'm curious what your solution would be to this. I, I I definitely feel like there would be limits to how far I could take the whole uh uh monster ranch concept. And definitely you would come up against an absurd example of say this adult red dragon that definitely, definitely would resist being tamed. Uh, But that's kind of a smart, subtle monster, and I can imagine that it would not want to be tamed, but it might very well go along with the taming exercise and act like it's been tamed, but then somehow spark some kind of adventure uh, later on where it it like causes significant trouble for the player characters by working on the inside. Maybe not because it wants to just kill them. If it wanted to just kill them, it would breathe fire on them, and that's the end. But because it's a dragon, it wants to play with their playthings, you know. And so I can absolutely. It wants access to this monster ranch that they're building. Ooh, it wants to run the monster ranch. I like it. Yeah, because they have some secret and super special uh, monsters that they have captured throughout their three years of adventuring. I would. You know, I think that is probably uh, a perfectly amazing solution for uh, dealing with players trying to adopt a, a, a creature that does not want to be adopted. And I think, uh, I think you know, sort of playing up, uh, you know, their driving goal, which seems to be to have a baby owlbear and have a owlbear pet of their own can be applied to enemies like fire giants or adult red dragons right um play up that this creature is antagonistic to you because it doesn't want you to kill it and they don't want to kill it but it also doesn't want you to adopt it and tame it right that its goals are different than that and it wants to stay free and it's going to be to be be able to resist through violence or other means uh your players to do that and it gives them a great great villain maybe not only does this fire giant not want to be their pet but it also wants to you know uh, uh maybe destroy their pet ranch and so there you've got a perfect antagonist for the next couple sessions sure and i i imagine jin's goal is to make sure that this powerful creature then doesn't just kill the player characters that these kids have invested so much of their time and themselves in. Um, and uh, I understand that. That's definitely a poser, is trying to figure out how to uh, take things that are conceptualized by the game as being incredibly dangerous and lethal things and make them into things that you know your, your kids' characters feel safe interacting with. I would think that kids who are worried about the lethality of pretend combat would also potentially have a 
a really harsh reaction to things just that that you know totally do a TPK on, on group right <laughs> yeah uh have the have the fire giant uh smash a stalactite in the cave show that he is mean and powerful and the players are gonna have to retreat and find a new way of dealing with it. well that's right and and i really i i wish i had all the answers but i don't and i can definitely see the problem uh in that well what if the kids just don't want to take that hint and they want to keep pressing the issue i don't have an answer to that and uh, I'm, I'm not sure that a good answer exists, that perhaps uh, uh, it, it just comes down to whether the agency of the game belongs entirely to the DM or whether you're going to allow the kids and their characters to push back on that and create their own reality. And yeah, yeah I don't know where that where that dividing line is. Different. And, and I, I don't think I have uh, any better advice on this uh you know, uh, sticky uh, situation than you. But back to the general uh, question posed by this letter, right? Okay, you know, you you want to play D and D, and and it sounds like you have a homebrewed campaign, and maybe this is in the ghost ghost assault marsh module, and you have um, other hooks that you need them to investigate, and they want to play Monster Ranch. So you could fully embrace that, right? You could make this game into a game of Monster Rancher. But, you know, if you've already done some of this prep and you're willing to uh, try and and your players are maybe willing to reach some kind of compromise with you, I think my suggestion is that uh, you integrate the plot goals that you've already have written in the module or have already homebrewed out with the idea of collecting pets, right? And that somehow these two are are similar and are aligned in their goals. And players, yeah, they got to go investigate the Swagen threat. But they've also heard, right, that those Swagen are are keeping uh, baby dolphins in a pin. And right. they need to go, uh, you know, free them. So, you know, well, okay, no los dos, right? Well, you know, you in this podcast have talked a number of times about the Session Zero uh, managing of expectations, right? Mm-hmm. You start the game by saying, well, here's what I envision the game as being about, and here's kind of the the rules to the, of how it's going to work, and I need to hear about what your expectations are going to be too. And, you know, maybe that needs to be a negotiation with your kids where you say, okay, here is some things that are going to be inviolate because I've already done some prep work and I know what the game is going to be about on that. And also but- I have to teach you middle school science. I don't have time to do more. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. At, but then if you kids have some things that you want the game to be about, if you want it to be about, you know, collecting monster friends, then uh, maybe I can work that in. Or maybe that flies in the face of what I've already prepared. And I'll have to lay down the rules at the beginning of the game and say, I'm sorry, I know you really want me to do that. But we can't do that. Come up with something else and I'll see if I can work it in. Right. But yeah. uh I would say, especially with kids who want to have some agency in the game, session zero is the perfect time to do that. Really, every session is a good time to do that, but session zero is the most time to, is the best time to do that and uh, let kids get their thoughts on what the game needs to be down so that you can work it in. Well, Jin, thank you for this amazing letter. Hopefully, some of this advice was at least marginally useful. Uh, and, uh, Andy, thanks, uh, again for coming on the show and, uh, sharing your thoughts on playing uh, D and D for kids. Hey, yeah, it's a blast. Uh, and uh, I hope some people enjoy this episode and, uh, take something away from it useful. Excellent. Hey, everyone out there, please, uh, keep hanging in there, uh, sending good vibes and good thoughts to you all. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, as always, please, uh, leave us a rating or a review. If you have tips or thoughts on running D and D for kids, uh, feel free to uh, send us an email at DM of none at gmail.com, or you can drop us a line at the dungeon master hotline, seven, seven, four, two, zero, three, four, six, two, nine. All right, everyone. Thanks again for listening. Say goodbye, Andy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And keep rolling those dice.